Hey everybody. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with creepypastas. They're basically the internet's equivalent of a campfire story. I myself have been a fan of these for many years. I remember getting into them back in the big creepypasta boom of 2012, 2013 or so, and I've honestly been hooked ever since. However, I think it's because of the fame of the characters that came out of that time, such as Slenderman, Jeff the Killer, Smile Dog, The Rake, those type of characters that we're all familiar with, that it's easy to forget that creepypastas existed long before that. In fact, creepypastas had been around for years by the time those characters became popular. Wanting to dig into this a little bit, I decided I would just do a quick Google search of what's the first creepypasta. And that led me to the story we're discussing today, Ted the Caver. Now, I had heard of Ted the Caver before. It's a very famous creepypasta, not just for being arguably the first creepypasta, but also for just being an all-around good horror story. And I figured recently, instead of just having it be this creepypasta of myth that I'd never checked out, that it's about time I read it. And because it's such a big piece of creepypasta history, again being arguably the first, I feel that it's important that we talk about it today. And that's exactly what we're going to do. I'm going to go through the story of Ted the Caver and see how it stands up in comparison to creepypastas nowadays. Ted's journey begins in December of 2000. Ted and his friend known as B are avid cavers. They've gone exploring in many caves and it's ultimately just their hobby. But a few years ago, B had a very bad accident. Whatever this accident was, it left B in very rough shape. The doctors even saying he would be unable to walk again. However, overcoming all odds, B was able to walk and is in fact able to still explore these caves, though he does have to move a bit slower than Ted does. There are many areas that Ted has to explore without B because they're just too difficult for him to go on. Regardless of this though, the two still like to explore caves together. The two men set their sights on a cave Ted had seen a while ago. Now Ted shares he does not want to reveal the name of this cave should anyone go there and then have anything, you know, negative fall upon them. So he calls the cave Mystery Cave. Now Ted has been to this cave before and says it's a little tricky to get into in the first place. In doing so they have to tie a rope to a tree and basically slide their way down. And as I have absolutely zero experience with caving, I'm going to let Ted's words describe how they get down there in the first place. To enter the cave, one must have a good length of rope in order to rappel down into the rock. A nearby tree serves as a good anchor point. Once the rope is tied to the tree, about 20 feet away from the small cliff, it can be tossed over the edge of the cliff to a small ledge 15 feet below. Cavers can then descend the short distance to the entrance. Once inside the cave, artificial light must be used. My light source of choice is a battery-operated, helmet-mounted light, known as a TAG light. Safe caving calls for at least two sources of backup lighting. For my backup lighting, I have a mini mag light mounted to my helmet, and another helmet mounted light in my pack, which I always carry with me. I also have glow sticks that I carry with me. These are not considered good sources of backup lighting by some, but they are good to use for taking lunch breaks, and they could be used to get out of a cave if the other sources fail. Now as I mentioned, Ted has been in this cave before, and on one of his last visits he noted near the bottom of the cave, deep down within it, there is a small hole. The small opening is located about 3 feet above the ground and is just about the size of a fist. This opening has air blowing through it, which sounds weird to someone like myself who's unfamiliar with this, but Ted says that there is an old phrase in caving called, if it blows, it goes. Sounds mildly inappropriate. Basically meaning that if there's air traveling through there, that there's enough space on the other side for it to actually be an open cave that they could explore, potentially at least. Throughout this story, Ted posts a lot of photos to accompany what we're reading. Here you can see a glove shoved into the hole just to show how small an opening we're dealing with here. He has photos taken from his Kodak camera such as this one and he's also provided illustrations throughout. And I'll show those as they come out throughout the story. Upon traversing all the way down into the bottom of the cave into the small opening three feet above the ground, Ted shines his light into the small opening to see what they're working with. He sees a very small and narrow passage go for about 10 to 12 feet, and then it opens up at the end. They can only see about 20 feet in total, but they believe at the end of that passage, it should open up enough for them to be able to actually explore the cave, assuming that it goes back further. Here's an illustration that Ted made of what they're dealing with here. 
you can see the narrow passage and then it goes out into a bigger opening. However, in order to enter that passage in the first place, they have to widen the small hole, as like I said, it's only about the size of a fist and a person's not gonna fit through there. Ted and B believe this to be a virgin cave, or in other words, a cave that no one's explored. This would mean that they would be the very first people to ever step foot inside that cave, potentially ever. And as cavers, they say this is basically one of the best things they could have found, and it drives their ambition to explore it further. So they begin work on widening the opening. They bring drills, hammers, and any other small but necessary item that they can bring down into the cave with them to expand it. Because the area they're working in is so small, they can really only work one at a time. So while one is drilling or hammering away, the other is basically sitting back against the cave wall, relaxing. So that way, whenever the other person is tired and done with their stent of it, the other can come take their turn. Basically meaning work on it can be non-stop while they're down there. Once the passage has been expanded a little bit, they decide they need to name it something. Because of how tight the squeeze will be to crawl through the passage, they name it Floyd's Tomb. This is named after Floyd Collins, who was a caver who tragically got stuck in a cave and died back in 1925. Floyd was stuck down in a cave for 14 days before finally succumbing to the elements and passing away, regardless of the fact that there was a giant rescue mission to get him out. If you want to hear more about Floyd Collins and what he went through down in that cave, you can watch the Internet Historian's video, Man in Cave, which also features the wonderful Wendigoon. It's a good video, and if you want to hear more about caving, I'd go check it out. Anyways, back to Ted the Caver. The two begin widening Floyd's tomb enough for Ted to be able to squeeze in it. Um, it's worth noting here that B is a slightly bigger guy than Ted, and because of that, they just do not have the time to widen everything out for B to fit. So basically what their plan is, is to get it big enough for Ted to be able to squeeze in, and then he'll document what he sees in there through video cameras and photos and whatnot for B to see. Although at this point it does not look like B will be able to enter the cave alongside his friend, he is still just as committed to getting this open so that way Ted can explore it. It is just as much his discovery as it is Ted's after all. I mentioned before that there is the air that blows through Floyd's tomb. Well, while they're trying to expand it, they notice that the air has picked up a bit and it's actually like blowing out of the hole, so much so that it's howling deep within the cave. The wind is so strong, something in there is howling and behind that, they can hear a low rumbling sound. Now, the two are underground. So they try and explain it as just vehicles driving on a road however many feet above them. But the issue is at the point that they're in the cave right now, no one should be on the road. Not as many vehicles, at least to make that constant rumbling sound. The two are kind of freaked out by this, but chalk it up to just something they can't explain. And maybe it's just the cave reverberating the sounds of their drilling or whatnot. They're not certain, but it's certainly something that lingers in the back of their minds. Anyways, trying to ignore the rumbling and the howling creeping them out, they actually make good progress, and you can see through this photo that they've widened it a good bit. They've already spent a good amount of time trying to widen the hole for Ted to get into Floyd's tomb, but they don't want to end up having wasted their time when Ted finally is able to get in there and cross through the end, and it being just the size of like a closet or something. So to try and see just how far back it really goes, they bring B's dog, Whip. Now, Whip is a small dog who is perfectly able to fit down into that cave and explore. So the plan is basically to bring her down into the cave with them. After all, she has been down in caves with them before, just not this one. They're gonna have her go through Floyd's tomb out on the end and then see how far back she goes, figuring that if she stops, it's cause there's a drop off or something and they won't be able to explore past that point. They bring Whip down and she's having a great time with them. She's enjoying all the new sense of the cave and whatnot. And is just having all around a good time being a cool dog in a cool cave. But all that changes as soon as she gets to Floyd's tomb. Whip becomes very afraid. The hairs on the back of her neck are standing up. She's not comfortable down here. So much so that she begins growling into the hole of Floyd's tomb. The sudden switch in her demeanor rightfully frightens Ted and B, who are suddenly very afraid of what's behind that cave. And this especially gets worse whenever Whip switches from growling to whimpering. 
in fear of whatever's back there, her tail going between her legs as she slowly backs away from the opening. Ted and B decide there's no way they can rightfully put Whip into Floyd's tomb to have her explore if she's that disturbed by it. They basically set up a little spot for her to sit away from the opening, and one of them sits with the dog while the other works on widening the hole. Although Ted notes while B's working on widening it, Whip cannot take her eyes off the opening of the cave. Ted says it's as though she's waiting for something to come out of it. B's still going though, drilling away at the opening, and he suddenly stops and begins looking into the cave. Ted comes back where he was sitting with Whip to come see what's up, and B says he thought he heard a sound in the cave. He said it sounded like rock was grinding against rock. Regardless of all the eerie stuff that's happened on this trip though, B's actually made outstanding progress. So much so that Ted is now able to fit his head into the hole and look around. However, it is then that Ted notices that the wind and the rumbling have stopped. He's not certain of when it stopped, if it was before or after B heard the sound of rock rubbing against rock, but he's kind of freaked out as the whole time they've been down there, it hasn't stopped once. If anything, it's gotten louder as they've been down there and stronger, but now there's no trace of it. Deciding that enough is enough, they pack up and leave for that day as well. The next time the two men return to the cave, they once again can hear the wind and the low rumbling, which kind of calms them down, especially given all the creepy things that happened last time. Ted is using the drill to widen the hole again, and it's worth noting this drill is very loud. They're in a very confined and cavernous space, so it echoes all across the walls right back into their ears. But over this sound, Ted hears a blood-curdling scream from deep within the cave. Even over the loudness of the drill, B hears it too and jumps up, runs up to Ted to see what it was. Ted turns off the drill and the two men listen, trying to hear what could have made that sound. What the heck was screaming within that cave? But as they listen, they hear nothing but silence. Fearing that something's about to come out of the hole towards them, they begin using rocks to plug up the hole in an effort just to prevent anything from coming at them, but... After a few minutes, nothing happens. The two cautiously remove the rocks out from the opening and slowly begin working again. Ted notes once again that the rumbling and wind have stopped. However, after all their days of work, they finally make some good progress again as they've widened enough for Ted to be able to squeeze through. Not just his head, but his whole body this time. They have to narrow it out a little bit more once they go deep into the passage, but they've established that Ted can do this and he can crawl through. It is unbelievably tight, and his body is completely pinned against itself as he goes, but he is able to make it through. So, after a little bit of tweaking, and just a little bit more widening for Ted's own comfort, Ted is finally able to go through Floyd's tomb. When he crosses through and lands on his feet, he notes that he's completely alone. Ted is on this side of the cave, and there's the passage, and then B is on this side. B cannot fit through that passage, meaning if anything happens to Ted over there, he's alone. Ted tries not to think of the screaming sound he heard the last time they were down there, but it constantly just eats away at the back of his mind as he traverses this cave. Perhaps because of that, or perhaps because he has actual reason to, Ted feels as though he's being watched. Nonetheless though, this has been their project for all this time, so Ted's gonna explore it thoroughly. The first thing Ted finds is this giant round rock leaning against the wall. Though it's not all that important or eye-catching, there's something about it that just seems weird. It, it, it's almost out of place to Ted. However, Ted takes a picture of the rock anyways. He explores the cave a little bit more before deciding his time's up and he needs to turn back to let B know, you know, he's not lost or anything in there. On his way back, Ted finds possibly the most interesting thing that the cave has to offer. He's making his way back to B when he sees a cave painting on the wall. Now, as was stated earlier, this cave is a virgin cave or so they thought. So no one should ever have been down here. And at the very least, no one has been in hundreds of thousands of years, meaning these are old. And this rightfully fascinates Ted, who goes to look at it and takes a photo of it with his camera. When he looks at it, though, he says it resembles a bunch of people with, with their hands up, praising some strange item in the middle. Ted takes a picture of this and then proceeds to leave the cave. He makes it all the way back to Floyd's tomb just fine, but as he's crawling through it, he hears rocks moving behind him. He's creeped out and hurries his pace a little bit, as there shouldn't be anything back there that's causing rocks to move. However, when he gets on the other side, he decides it's best not to tell B about that. Now, by this point, as you've seen, Ted has taken several pictures of his explorations. 
But for whatever reason, whenever Ted passes the room with the cave painting, none of the pictures developed, right? You can see through this photo that you can kind of see the rock in the back there, just a little bit. But the up-close picture Ted took of it, and the picture of the cave paintings, none of those actually developed. Now, Ted wants to go back and explore that again, and B wants Ted to as well. But on the off chance that anything happens, they want someone in there with Ted. And because B can't fit, they decide they need to find someone to come with them. So, they go to their mutual caving friend, a man named Joe. They swear Joe to secrecy, making sure he won't tell a soul about this cave or where it's located at. Remember, this is Ted and B's discovery. They want to explore it thoroughly first before they let anyone else know where it's at. Besides, of course, Joe. Once Joe agrees and they feel they can trust him, they take him to the cave to explore it with them. However, perhaps their biggest mistake is that they don't tell Joe about any of the weird things that have happened. Nothing about the photos not being developed, nothing about the rumbling or the howling of the wind, and certainly not the strange scream that they heard earlier. So B basically stands guard outside of Floyd's tomb like he has, and Ted and Joe go into the cave. However, while Ted is going through, he accidentally hits his head on the wall of Floyd's tomb. Very badly. So much so that he feels he might have a concussion, and doesn't feel it's safe to continue onward into the cave with Joe. He basically gives Joe good directions and says, Good luck, we'll be on the other side if you need us. Now, if anything does happen, Ted feels that he's in decent enough shape to be able to go in after him, but due to the fact that he already feels bad from having hit his head, he decides it's probably best if he waits out with B. So he tells Joe how to get to the room with the hieroglyphics, and then heads back the way he came. Ted and B have some time to reflect here alone now, knowing that someone is in the cave, and that they're on the other side. They begin discussing the weird things that have happened, and feel they probably should have told Joe about all the weird things before sending him in there alone. They begin calling for him, trying to get him to come back, but... Joe doesn't answer. They basically gave Joe a 20 minute window to go in and out of the cave, but that time passes and they have not yet heard from him. Ted waits a few more minutes still calling for Joe into the cave, hoping that he'll answer, but he never does, leading Ted to reluctantly put all his gear back on to go in after him. Right as he's about to go through though, they see a light at the end of Floyd's tomb. It's getting brighter and brighter as it comes towards them quickly. They call out to see if it's Joe, and this time they finally get a response. It's a weak response though, but it's definitely Joe's. They call for him asking, Joe, are you okay? Are you alright? And they hear a very weak, no. That being said though, Joe crawls through Floyd's tomb at record pace, not wanting to be stuck on the other side of it. He crashes to the ground in front of B and Ted huffing and puffing and they get to look at him and see he's covered in scrapes as he forced himself through Floyd's tomb so quickly his arms are bleeding and the rest of him's cut. On top of that he looks unwell, ill, sick. Something clearly is wrong. He's winded and just sits on the ground trying to catch his breath until he suddenly gets up and scurries out of the cave not saying a word to B or Ted. Ted and B follow him and also leave the cave wanting to find out what happened to their friend. Once they all surface they get into the truck and leave, headed back home. They ask Joe what happened, but he won't give them any specifics. Ted asks if he saw the cave painting or the round rock, but Joe says no. He never saw any of that. Which for as deep as they believe he went in that cave and as long as he was in there, that should be impossible. Ted and B reluctantly tell Joe about the strange things that happened in the cave when they were there, but Joe doesn't say a word to respond. They drop him back off, and he says he never wants to go into that cave again. They try and get in touch with Joe in the next few days, but he never answers them. They even hear from a mutual friend that he hasn't gone into work. Ted and B are worried about their friend and freaked out about what happened in that cave, but for whatever reason, they just can't put it to rest. They just can't get the cave out of their mind, so much so that they hesitantly go back to explore the cave again. This time, Ted brings a video camera. He's going to record what's in the cave so this time B can see it. So everything goes as normal. Ted and B enter the cave, and B waits outside the squeeze as Ted goes through Floyd's tomb and out to the other side. He has his video camera, and he has his helmet with the light mounted on, as well as his bag. Ted passes the room with the cave painting and the round rock and continues down a new passage. Yet, as he's going, he notes that somehow it seems darker than it has before. It's not so much as though his light isn't working after all Ted had fully charged it before they left, but more like the darkness is eating at his light source, making it not as bright as though the darkness is overtaking it. On top of that, the ground of this passage is covered in fragments of broken rock. It's as though something had been chiseling away in this opening 
much as they had chiseled away at the openings of Void's tomb. As he's walking down this passage, though, he again hears the sound of rock scraping against rock. It sounds as though it's coming from the room right behind him. Ted jumps and hits his head on the ceiling, which causes him to fall to the ground in pain. Worst of all, though, him hitting his head on the ceiling broke his helmet lamp, leaving Ted in complete darkness. As the scraping stops, Ted fearfully begins to dig around in his backpack for his glow sticks. He holds it out in his hand, but is terrified to illuminate it, as he does not want to see what will be waiting for him in the darkness when he does. Realizing that he has no choice if he wants to leave the cave, though, he cracks it, and as it slowly begins to illuminate, he sees nothing. This is almost worse to him, though, as he realizes he's not alone. He has no clue where whatever is moving is. It's just him, a glow stick, the darkness, and something hiding in it. He very slowly moves, as the glow stick can only illuminate about a foot or two in front of him, trying to find his way back. As he heads to the room with a cave painting, and the round rock though, he notices that the rock has moved. That was the source of the scraping sound. This giant round rock had moved. It was previously leaning against the wall, but now it's almost in the middle of the floor. And he notices why it had moved. He uses the glow stick and looks down and sees that there's a giant hole under the rock. The rock had basically acted as a cork to keep it contained. But now the rock had moved. To Ted, this means the worst thing he could possibly imagine. Whatever was beneath that rock down in that hole had moved it, hence the scraping sound, and had crawled out of that hole and is now somewhere in the darkness with him. Realizing how bad the situation is, he throws caution to the wind and runs all the way back to Floyd's tomb. His sides are being scraped against the walls, causing cuts and bruises all along him, but he doesn't care just as long as he gets out of there. He begins screaming for B to get out of the cave as quick as he can. When he finally gets to Floyd's tomb, he pushes his backpack into the opening and realizes then that when he'd hit his head on the ceiling, he had dropped the camera way back in the cave. He contemplates for a moment, maybe I should go back and get the camera. But the fear of whatever had moved that rock, the fear of whatever was in there with him, made him abandon the thought of going back for that camera immediately. He begins to quickly crawl through Floyd's tomb once again. It's just scraping at his sides, but he doesn't care just as long as he gets out of there. When he's about midway through, though, he smells decay, death, the worst scent he has ever smelled in his life. It's like a corpse is under his nose and rotting, and it's getting stronger and stronger. This only rejuvenates his fight to get out, though, as he continues to crawl and crawl and crawl until he's finally out of Floyd's tomb and falls to the ground. He wants to just sit on the cold cave floor and lay there, catch his breath, but then he hears a scraping sound within Floyd's tomb, and he quickly gets to his feet and chases after B to get out of the cave. Usually when leaving the cave, Ted would put on a harness or something so that way he can safely ascend. This time though, out of pure fear and adrenaline, he just starts free climbing it, using the rope to climb out, knowing that if he falls, it is certain death. But somehow that seems better than meeting the fate of whatever is chasing him from that cave. He climbs and climbs and climbs. B gets to the top before him and dismounts all his gear. Ted is still climbing as he notices that the rope next to him is moving ever so slightly. It's being pulled on by something down in the cave. It suddenly snaps and is dragged down into the darkness. If Ted was on that, it surely would have taken him. He climbs quicker and quicker until he finally surfaces. Now remember, there is a rope tied to the tree that they typically use to go down. As the two men lay on the grass, they see that that rope is slowly being tugged on as well, though this one, unlike the one that just shot down into the cave, but this one is not trying to be dragged into the cave like the one before. Something seems to be climbing this one from the darkness. B cuts the rope with his pocket knife, sawing at it as quick as he can until it finally frays and snaps, plunging whatever was down there back into the cave, back into the darkness and away from the surface. The two men lay for a while, trying to catch their breath and their bearings, until they finally go to the truck to leave. They don't say a word to each other the whole car ride home. Almost immediately after this event, Ted begins being plugged with nightmares. He can't sleep at night, something is haunting his dreams, and unfortunately, it doesn't end there. While he can't sleep because of the nightmares, they begin creeping into his day-to-day -day life. 
He hears noises in his apartment that he can't explain. On top of that, he swears he can see a figure following him around in the darkness in the corner of his eye. He can never quite place it, but something is following Ted. During all of this one night, Ted gets the urge to go to a place called Outlook Point, somewhere that overlooks the city to see all the city lights. Ted doesn't know why he has the desire to go there, but for whatever reason, every fiber of his being is telling him that is the place he needs to be. So in the middle of the night, he gets in his car and goes. Whenever he parks, he gets out for some fresh air and notices there's someone else there leaning against their car. Ted walks to see who it is and sees it's Joe. He hadn't seen or even spoken to Joe since Joe's poor endeavor in the cave. And the two talk for a while and realize they're both being plagued with the same things. They decide that the only way they move on from this is to go back into the cave. They decide the next day at noon is when they need to go. So Ted goes to talk to B. B's spooked by what he sees with his friend, but also decides that if they're to get any closure on this, they need to go confront the cave once and for all. Ted shares in this blog post, he's almost excited to get this over with. He says to the people that he loves not to worry about him. He says that he will conquer this cave and get his life back and come back a better man. He tells his audience that by the time they read this, he'll likely already be deep within Mystery Cave, past Floyd's tomb, and into the unknown. He says that he will update the readers very soon, likely within the next day or two, and to wait on his next response. That was posted in 2001. Ted never made a follow-up entry. So that is the story of Ted the Caper, debatably the first creepypasta. Like I said, I remember there being a big creepypasta boom in 2012, around the time I got into it, which has its own branch of creepypastas and cliches, notably with God, the hyper-realistic eyes. It is now, time of recording this, 2023. The story has aged relatively well, I'd say. Um, it's definitely one of the best creepypastas I've read in a long time, and I understand the hype behind it. I think where Ted the Caver stands now in 2023 is not only is it a good creepypasta, but it's a good horror story, as well as a good time capsule into what horror was like in the early 2000s. Without Ted the Caver, it's not likely we would have had many of the stories that we saw in that 2012 creepypasta boom, and from there, many of the stories that we have now. That's where I think Ted the Caver stands now. I'm not going to sit here and comment on if I think it's a true story or anything like that. Um, not likely. But that's not really the point of this video. The point of this video was to go back and look at an old creepypasta and see where it stands today. And I'd say it stands pretty good. That's pretty well it when talking about Ted the Caver for today. It's a great story and I enjoyed reading it and especially talking about it. So I'll thank all of you guys for watching who are here for that. I do want to do one quick announcement though. The last video I uploaded was my winter of 83 video and I didn't expect that video to do as well as it did. Even the creator Linkara top the fourth wall commented on it which just absolutely blew my mind. The support for that video has been insane. I think we're up to almost 40 likes right now and it's got me to at the time of recording this 35 subscribers um and and I, I i just wanted to say thank you guys so much for that that that's, that's so cool honestly um i i really can't thank you guys enough um and just thanks for watching i i do plan on doing another analog horror series relatively soon so if you're here for that don't worry i've got another one that i want to do recommended by uh some of you guys that commented on that so thank you for that yeah no, uh, uh, enough of the uh, the sappy stuff just uh thank you guys so much for all your support on that um and thank you again for watching this video if you stuck around to hear me uh, talk at the end here. So I'm going to go and head out uh, and start work on editing this. Um, but thanks again, guys, and I hope you all have a great day.